Yo, yo, what up? It's your boy Saga on the Almighty Y'all Father. And right now, you tapped in with my man, my brother, the homie, the legend, Mikey T, the movie star. You know what I mean? Reporting from the streets to penal everywhere. Shout out my man, Mikey T. Stay tuned, boy. You know, I had told Ab, I had told AR Rab that I was actually uh, linking with you for an interview. And he had said, he said, yo, Tech 9 is a legend on the independent scene. And I actually was around Saigon a couple times. I was in the studio with him in True Life. He's good friends with True Life. He yeah. also came to Philly and rode around with Low. He was yeah. a cool dude when I was around him, and he can rap his ass off. Dope, dope. Now, I love AR, man. AR is a good nigga, man. I, I hate to see him in this situation because I hate to see when that shit happens to good dudes, man. Regardless of whatever the fuck they trying to say, what he um, they allege he did, he got a big heart. And he took he take care of other people, man. He take he he's a nigga that likes to take care of everybody else first. You know what I'm saying? Make sure everybody else is good. And when you look at a person like that, you gotta respect that shit. You gotta respect that a lot, man. So I I, I hope hopefully the, with the legal shit, the, the court shit. I hope, hope you know you gotta keep fighting. You gotta stay in that law library and fight. For your life, you know what I'm saying? It's a situation where you gotta there's always loopholes, there's always a, there's always something in the legal system. And, and Lord willing, you know, he'll be out, he'll be out, he'll get up out of there, man. But yeah, low, 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 them, those are my guys. I hang out with Philly. Like I said, like when I go to Philly, I like, niggas take me to cheesesteak spot. Like most niggas do a show in Philly and get the fuck in and out. But they like, you never know what the fuck's gonna happen in Philly. Right. But you know, you know down there, niggas hit me up. We hanging out. We hollering at hoes and at the, the, the cheese steak spot. They bring me the hole in the wall and shit. I'm like, fuck it. I'm here. We here. We here. So yeah. Saigon, how did you initially link up with Dark Low though? Was it for a record? Nah, we never even did a record yet. It was just just real, recognizing real. I was just doing a show in Philly, and he just hit me like, I mean, you got a show in Philly, I'm gonna pop out. I was like, come on. But when he popped out, like he came, we met up before I even went on stage. So, you know, uh, we we got in the sprinter, chopped it up, kicking in. Like I I didn't know him from a can of paint, man. And then we just start chopping it up. But real re real niggas don't recognize. It's the same thing with AR and True and all them niggas. Like real nigga, you don't it don't take two ten seconds to feel a nigga energy to know if a nigga's weirdo or not. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And when I got around them brothers, I'm like, oh, these are these are like-minded A like. These are my A like niggas. Like not just on those street shit. Like we all street. Everybody come from the same. We all come from the ghetto. But the whole thing is like these are stand-up guys. These are niggas who I know is, is those kind of niggas. Like you can smell it's alpha male shit. You know what I mean? Facts, man. You know that's crazy. That I was just I was watching your interview on the Breakfast Club from back in the day, and you were talking yeah. about how you and True Life that's one of your best friends in the industry. So in the world, in the yeah. world, yeah, in the world, yeah, in yeah. real life, my you God. Know, uh, so Ab actually popped up in the studio with y'all. Yeah, yeah, Ab came to the studio. They did a record um, with my man, my man Velis. Yep, I was there when they did um, no I smoke too. Um, no um, smoke. No smoke, yeah, no smoke. That record was fire, huh? That's yeah. one of my favorite AR, and not because I was there when they did it, but just because I just love that energy on that record. Yeah. Yeah, they it vote. Hell, no, no, no. And I love AR as a rapper. Like, this shit is like, it's like watching a movie where you're like, you got to just stay in, just stay tuned. Like, what is this nigga going to say next? Yeah. It is vivid. His rhymes are so vivid. It's like, <laughs> and it's, I love, I love AR as a rapper. I think he slept on as a rapper. He's not gonna lyrical miracle you. He's gonna say some witty, funny shit and get right to the point. You know, <laughs> yeah. which is yeah. which I appreciate with, with artists. Yo, crazy enough, Saigon. I've always said, you know, Vellis is known for putting the hook on something, and then more of a big artist will come on and cover it up. I was thinking they should have put designer on No Smoke doing that Vellis hook. That would have been that would have been fire. But at the time they did it, like even Bell still now. Bell's super talented. Bell still Bell wrote motherfucking the, the Drake and Chris Brown song. He won a Grammy with French Kanye. Yeah. Uh, Kanye, right? Yep. He, no, but he wrote that fucking whole um um the the the, the Drake the Chris Brown song. Um, 
Um, you got it, girl. You got it, girl. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that Vela's. Movie. That's all Vela's pen. You know what I'm saying? So, Valley Vela is that nigga. We call him Machiavellis. You know what I'm saying? That nigga's pen is crazy. So, at the time when they did the record, he, he didn't have that much of a... Not too many people knew about him. So, and we was just like, fuck it. Like, keep Vela's on everything. Like, Vela's was like in-house. And we was like, fuck all of He's a writer. And he's, he more so like, yo, have somebody else do it. I'll write it, but have somebody else do it. We like, nah, we keeping you on everything. Because everybody wants the nigga to really also be an artist. And just trying to push him to be an artist as well. Yeah, you know, I would remember French and Chinks. And uh, they would yeah, all... Yeah, I, I came up with all those guys, man. French. I remember French used to interview us, man. French, uh, Cocaine City. Like, that nigga was a boy who was even taking rap serious. You know what I'm saying? He just came and blew past all of us. Like, <laughs> All of us who we used to come with Cocaine City with the DVD, the interview niggas and shit. When he became a rapper in the two years, that nigga was out of head. <laughs> like, yo, look at Prince Montana on the Grammys and shit. So, but, but we love, I love, me personally, I don't know about other people, I love seeing that shit. I love to see niggas come up. I love I to see niggas feel like uh, he gave Max B the platform he needed after the whole, you know, disbanding with Dipset, Bird Gang. Fact, and fact, fact, big fact. And Max gave him the wave, so it right. worked for both of them. You know what I'm saying? Wave, Max gave him that wave. That's my guy, Charlie Wingate. Free Max B. That's my motherfucking heart right there. Free, free Max B. Free fucking Charlie Wingate, nigga. Charlie Wingate the great. That's my guy. Yo, Saigon, I was going to ask you about Max B. You know, uh, did you ever get a chance to link with Max B and work with him? Do you have any Max B? Yeah, that's my for? friend. That's my friend, man. Like, my, my, that's my friend, like. Charlie Rambo, his name is Charlie Rambo, but he a jail nigga like us. Like before this bit, he did like almost a dime. He did eight years. He came out, you know what I'm saying? And then he, before he caught this bit, but he, you know, he, my man Reese, him and my man Reese, y'all feel they mad? They like this. They was mad close to the joint. But that nigga, yeah. But yeah, but we, we, we in Harlem when he was home. And never I'm in Harlem, I saw I hit up. Yo, where we at with it, man? Where way? Where, where the way back? He's like, yo, yo, the wave is over here on this fucking 125th Street. Yo, I'm over here. <laughs> nigga, he's a character, bro. If you've never met a character in your life, you need to meet Max B, bro. <laughs> There's not a dull moment with that nigga Max B. So. Never. Not even a split second. The fact is, Max B will be home soon. He'll be home in the next few years, Saigon. What do you yeah. foresee for Max B coming home to this music industry? He's good. He's good. He got a support system. He got he got the right people. People love him. The same thing. Like, look at Bobby Schmurder. Bobby Schmurder running around with more jewelry than anybody. He didn't drop a song yet. You know what I'm saying? He stood tall. When you stand tall, niggas appreciate it. Especially now with rats and shit running around and niggas doing the corny shit. Because niggas want to, rappers want to be street niggas. Leave the street shit alone, bro. The street, get the, the, the name of the game is get the fuck away from the street shit. We, we be in street shit because we don't have a choice. You know what I'm saying? When you out there hustling and robbing niggas and sticking niggas up, you ain't doing it because you want to do it. You doing it because you ain't got no fucking choice. You got you to feed your family. You got to feed yourself. So when you got it and you want to be a part of that or pretend you're a part of that shit or be down with that shit, you're a fucking fool. You know what I mean? You're a fucking idiot. So he's going to be good. Max is coming home to niggas who's in position, man. Nobody going to have a, he gonna, If you want to do music, you're going to be able to do whatever you want which is a good thing. I think that's great, man, because he stood tall. He ain't tell on nobody. He stood tall. He, he, you know, he ain't, Max wasn't even there. Max had every reason in the world to tell on a nigga. <laughs> you know what I mean? He wasn't even there when the crime went down. They got all the 75 fucking years. You know what I'm saying? Before they gave him a time cut. But you know what I'm saying? Like, that's every reason in the world to be like, he did it. And that nigga stood tall. You know what I'm saying? But, that, but that's that's Charlie. That's that's, that's Max, bro. That, that's 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 Max B. So yo, Saigon, man, I want to welcome you to the channel. You know, I really appreciate you giving me the chance to get your story. Yeah, man. You know, truly one of the greatest stories never told, man. You know, we saw it yeah. play out in front of our eyes, but now I think it's important that the world sees it from yours. Yeah, now and I appreciate you, man, because I love what you do, man. I pay, I'm, I'm tuned in. I stay tapped. Even when I'm out the way, I, I stay tapped in and what's going on in the culture and see who's moving, who's shaking, who's not, who's trying, who's frauding. Like, like I just pay attention. You know, I don't speak much. 
I watch. I'm very observant. You know, I, I observe. And I love what you're doing. I love the fact you're giving my brother A.R. Ab a voice from behind the wall. I was saying, I was like, I know A.R. Ab is fucked up as his condition he is in. And because I've been there and I know, I know what it's like. The fact that he has you to, to be a voice still, that he, he must look forward to that. You know what I'm saying? That must be like a, a release to be like, okay, I'm still connected. Even though I'm in here, I'm still connected. Because when you're in jail, it's like you're dead. You know what I'm saying? It's like niggas don't, niggas forget. Your family, your closest family members forget about you. You know what I'm saying? I after a couple, that. after a couple years, it's gonna be your moms, your father if you got one, and your siblings, even aunts and cousins and all the niggas. They they out of here. Your closest cousin might write you once or twice, like, "Hey, I'm thinking about you." But that might be every far and few, every couple months. But you, it's like having the experience of being dead while you're still alive. So the fact that you give him a voice and letting him, his his opinion still matter, and he talks about current events and all that shit, like I think that's wonderful. And I, I salute you for that shit. You know what I mean? I appreciate that, Saigon. You know, I, I didn't really model it after what I'd seen in, in the past in hip hop. You know, like Karen Civil, when Lil Wayne got locked up, she did Letters to Wheezy, where she made a website. But, you know, I just know I've worked with Max B in the past. I did an interview with Max B that went on every single website and was mm -hmm. in magazines and, and even on French Montana's album. You know what I mean? So being able to give Ab a light like this is just like, I feel like I'm doing right by hip hop. Yeah, you are. You definitely are. Because we paying attention. We watching. And that's our brother. And, and, and Ab, Ab is beloved in his culture. He's one of the beloved ones. So the fact that we can still hear from him and know he's doing all right, know that he's, he's, his spirits is up, that shit means a lot. You know, to us and to, and to, I'm sure to his, his friends and family, his personal friends and family. You know what I mean? So, yo, uh, Saigon, I wanted to ask, when did hip-hop first present itself to you as something you could potentially do? Oh, something I can do? Oh, um, in prison. In prison. Right. That's where the whole y'all father shit come from. Right. Because I always rapped. I rapped my whole life. I always rapped growing up. So it was like, you know what I'm saying? Since I, 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 grew, I'm, I was born in the late 70s, so... I grew up with when hip hop was new, I was new. So we kind of grew up together. You know what I'm saying? So there's not a point in my life where I don't remember there not being rap. You go to people older than me and they'd be like, oh, I remember when rap came around. Like, I don't, I can't say that because I kind of, the first, the first music I was introduced to in life was hip hop. So but when I knew, when I thought I could do it myself and, and I thought I could actually be an artist was in prison. When I started to rap and start to write shit down, I, I lack of doing other shit. And then I start battling and I was winning the battles. And then I started to realize, damn, I beat everybody in this jail battling. I'm the, I'm the nigga. Then I go to another jail, they move me, go on the draft. I beat everybody in that jail. I'm like, I'm, I'm really good at this shit. And, and then you got to be, not, niggas want to boo you. They want to say you trash. They want, because niggas is all miserable. Like most, 90% of the time, niggas is, ain't mad they in jail they fucking stress that like you know you try to make the best of it so that little that little bit of time where niggas rapping and that's like a getaway so i became to the point where niggas would be like i'd be doing concerts in the yard when they get to the point where like niggas would be like yo can we get that concert <laughs> like you took like a week so you ain't rapped in a week so i i'd be the entertainment in the jail that's what they do that's why they call me the yard father i was the, i was the yard father i go to the yard and rap all fucking day you know, and battle every other rapper in every jail in every jail I've been in. That's when I believe if I'm good enough to do this shit in here and get all these people's attention and what's where people want more, I can go home and do this shit. That's what made me believe I could do it. How did you end up getting locked up and how much time did you ultimately serve? Because I I heard you said you served about as much time as Shine. I no, nah, I didn't now nah, Shine was Shine did like eight eight, nine joints. Yeah. I, I kept going. The thing with me is I've been going to jail since I was 12. I went to DFY. In New York, before you can go to adult jail, they got some shit called DFY, Division for Youth. So it's like until you're 16, they can't put you on an island. So they, I, but I've been going to Sparford and try on. I, I started going to jail when I was thir 13 years old, 13. And the most, the most time I was out at home from 13 to 22 was probably six months, three months. Three to six months. If I had to, I, I was a jail. I was one of the people where everybody was like, oh, he's a jailbird. 
you know, jailbirds, like they call them jailbirds, like the niggas is just always in jail. <laughs> that's it. Out in my fan, that's why I was like, I ain't, I can't be no jailbird. Like it's it's too many jailbirds in my family. I got jailbird uncles, jailbird cousins, and niggas. It's like when they come home, they visit it. You almost just count the time to when they're gonna be back in jail. Everybody got one of those in their family. And I was becoming that. And I was like, hell no. So after the last time I came home, the last time I the most time I did in one stretch was five years and six months. And I was like, I'm done with this shit, bro. You actually got your name Saigon while you were incarcerated? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Could you break that, could you break that down for me, man? I mean, if yeah, I was reading a book, I was reading a book by Wallace Terry called Bloods. And it's funny because I got the I got the book thinking it was about the blood gang. <laughs> the gang called Bloods. So I'm like, oh shit, this looks interesting. Bloods. And this is like before the blood gang was even in New York. It was still like a West Coast thing. And so, but I, I want to read it. And but the, the book was about the Vietnam War. And the and the book was made of excerpts from journals from black soldiers who was in the arm the who was in the in the, in the in the Vietnam War. And they was in Saigon. Saigon was a city. So they were writing their journals about fucking prostitutes or doing doing heroin or sneaking heroin to the country or how they going can't wait to get out of there or how they they not leaving or they or they not coming back to America. So it was just an interesting book. It was a war-torn, Saigon was a very war-torn city. That's why they changed it to Ho Chi Minh. They try to erase the history of the whole city. And that's what I try to do with myself. I, when I said I want to be, I want to change my life. I don't want to be no jailbird nigga. I don't want to do crime shit. So I was a war-torn individual. So I'm like, si the same thing that Saigon happened when they changed the name and shut it down. I'm going to do that with my life. I'm not fuck all this thinking I got to shoot niggas to be to, to, to make me a man and, and like this gun is what's gonna make me pop and all this shit. I'm like, nah, I gotta start using this shit, you know, man? Because this is just land, landing me in jail. It's landing me in fucking jail. I'm saying, like, oh, all this shit, street shit is cool. And what you deem is respect on the street, it ain't respect, it's fear. And nigga that don't fear you don't like you. A nigga that fear you will laugh at every joke you tell. You could tell nigga, why did the chicken cross the road? Nigga's like, you was a funny nigga, son. Because they scared, they don't want you to act stupid or do no dumb shit. But as soon as you walk away, they be like, I can't stand that nigga, bro. I don't like being around that nigga. Because they, they're uncomfortable around you. And we look at it as, as respect. It ain't respect, my nigga. It's fear. A nigga that fear you will kill be the quickest nigga to kill you. Know what I mean? That's crazy, man. Because I was going to ask you, you know, if it wasn't Saigon, could it be anything else? But after hearing that depiction, you know, of why you gave your name Saigon, it totally makes sense. Yeah, no, nah, no, nah. it, it, it fit perfect, man. And so some people see me be like, why are you Saigon? You're not Asian. And I said, no, nah, it's, it's, it's a whole it's different. Deeper than that. Uh, yeah, it's so much deeper than that. If only you knew, you know what I'm saying? So when you were released from prison, what was the scene like in the music industry and how did you jump into it? Oh, oh, man. The scene was crazy, bro. It was like, it was Jay-Z world. It was, you know, um. You know, we had just lost Big and Pac a couple years before that. So it was like, Jay-Z was king. Jay-Z is still the king, but he was becoming the official king of the game. And I came, I was lucky enough to, because of that whole y'all fault and shit, I generated a buzz so big in the prison system that I had dudes from the music industry coming to visit me in jail. So there was a guy named Ben Rue who came to visit me, he worked with Maddie C and Scott Free. They, they were A&Rs at Loud Records. They had just did um, Mob Deep, second out, murder music. They signed Mob Deep, they signed Wu-Tang, they signed Cellar Dwellers, they signed Exhibit. Everybody who was at Loud Records, they worked with Steve Rifkin, two A&Rs, my boys, Scott Scott and Maddie. So when I was in jail, they, they I used to be on the phone with these niggas like, yo, when, they was like, well, when you come home, son, it's on and popping when you come home. Blah, 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 blah. I rapped through, I rapped to the niggas over the phone once or twice. They was like, we don't even want to hear you rap over the phone. We want to, don't worry about it. When you come home, you good. So I come home. When I got out, it was like, I go meet with these niggas. And so then guy, Matty C, he's the guy who kind of discovered, he put Biggie in Unsigned High. I wouldn't say he discovered him because he, uh, it was, that's more like Mr. C discovered him. But when Biggie was the unsigned, he's the one who put him in the Source magazine, unsigned hype, him and DJ 50 Grand or whatever. So he told me, I'm going to do the same shit with you what I did with Biggie. 
to, to see if you can get on and shit. You know what I mean? To see if we're going to sign you. So I'm like, shit, nigga, I'm ready. I'm thinking of all these jail raps, how many people I impressed in prison and all that shit. So I'm like, nigga, bring it on. You know what I'm saying? I'm ready. I'm built for this shit. And so what he would do, he had two turntables. I never forget this shit. So he just throwing instrumentals. And he'll change them shits without you knowing. Just like, don't stop rapping. Just rap. That's what I did with Big. That's what made me want to made a, sign Big and all this shit. So he'll throw on a beat. That shit might be 89 beats per minute. And then the next beat, it'd be like 175,000 beats per minute. So you just got to be able to rap to any beat. What I didn't realize, I didn't know how to do. I rapped to one tempo all the years in jail. <laughs> Did I? It was this. My niggas on the corner hit me off with a pound and a quarter gold. I go to see my mom. She all based out. Pops is the corner. My, like, strapping like that. You know what I'm saying? The whole. So when he throwing on the fast ass beats, I didn't know. I was like. I was mumbling. I was like, "Yo, can you slow that down a little bit?" But he's like, "Nah, a real rapper can rap to anything." You know, what I'm like, well, I guess so. The fact I couldn't rap to any tempo, they they weren't interested. They were like, "Ah, he, he's cool with one tempo." But that, other than that, like that slow ass Griselda with Griselda does now, I would have been perfect for that shit because that's. I, I needed the slow beats. I wanted you to hear everything I was saying. I didn't space my words out. So after that, it was like, they, they was like, ah, he's cool. So I was like, fuck, that was my shot. To me, that was my shot. So it was like, so my man was selling drugs. I'm like, I, I convinced my, my man was a big drug dealer to invest in my rap career. And he did. And I just went in the studio and got busy and started passing out mixtapes. I used to fucking harass K Slay. I, you know, me and K Slay, ask K Slay, man. He was like, yo, that nigga was fucking terror. I almost kicked K Slade door down because he wouldn't listen to my demo. <laughs> when you started releasing these mixtapes, how did you make yourself stand out enough to like attract the attention of Just Blaze? Um, before it was Just Blaze, I was signed to Mark Ronson. People don't really know that. I was signed to Mark Ronson, who's a huge producer in the game. He discovered Amy Winehouse. Like Mark, Mark Ronson did fucking don't believe me, just that. And then, and then, don't believe me, just watch. Like, that's the first guy who gave me a shot. And uh, he bought my first time on an airplane. I went to Australia. <laughs> my first time on an airplane, first time leaving the country, I went to Australia, like, fucking with Mark Ronson and shit to do a song with this kid, Daniel, Maywe Daniel Merriweather. So I didn't, once I got with him and that didn't work out, I'm looking at it again, like, fuck, man, like, this shit, maybe this shit, maybe I'm not as good as the niggas in jail was telling me I was. You know what I'm saying? Like, but maybe I just, I got to figure something out. Cause I still didn't want to go back to prison. I still didn't want to go back to life of crime, but it was like I gotta figure something out. So I was like, "Damn, this rap shit gotta work." And Sycamore, Sycamore, the, who was now A and R, who was a DJ at the time, he used to make these these instrumental D, um, CDs and just put beats on them. And you know, I just kept rapping, and and I, I me and Slade developed a relationship. Slade hosted my first mixtape. I met this kid in Gotti, he worked at the Source magazine. He's like, yo, I think you're dope, bro. I'm going to put you on Unsigned Hype. He put me on Unsigned Hype. And then we, he was just like, yo, let me help you. I'll help you. I'm like, bro. But I was still in the street doing dumb shit. Like, I hit a kid in the head with a bottle. He pressed charges on me. So I got bailed out. I was dating this model, this rich model and shit. And then I got, she bailed me out. And I was like, like I'm fucking my life. She like, yo, if you keep on this path, I don't think this is going to work out. This relationship. And she can go. She's a famous model to this day. She's an actress and a famous model to this day. And you could buy, you could run a clip right now. I'll send you a clip. <laughs> but yeah, but to the, uh, but yeah, she was like, this ain't gonna work out. So when she left me, life got dark again. I was like, fuck. But I ain't had no option. I'm like, I gotta keep, I got a pound of payment with the music. One day I got a call from Sycamore. He was like, yo, would you work with Just Blaze? I literally would. He was like, if you can make it to the studio in 30 minutes, I was an hour away from the studio. He was like, if you can make it in 30 minutes, just lay here. And he want to meet you. I was telling him about you. Nigga, I, I ran every light. I was in a car accident. I made it there probably 30 minutes from an hour away. Like, I was not fucking up the opportunity. And Just Blaze gave me six beats that day. He was like, y'all, I heard a lot about you. You know what I mean? I'm looking for a new artist to start the label. But he was like, 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you six beats. He's like, pick one of these beats. I want to hear how you sound over my shit. He's like, pick one. And, um, you know, when you're done with it, hit me up. So I wanted to impress him. So when I went back to the studio, I recorded a song to every beat that night, to all the beats. And I came back the next day, like, hey, I did a song to all of them. He was like, what? In one night? Like, I said, yeah, I, I'm not fucking playing around. Like, I got to get, get up to speak. So that, I think my work ethic impressed them probably even more than the music. And then that's what we, that's what we did the deal. Damn, that's what's up, man. Each one of those songs deserves its own podcast as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Letter P was one of those songs. Before Coogee Rap was on it, it was the Letter P. I, it was just me on it. Looking back at it in hindsight, man, what do you think Just Blaze added to you as an MC? You know what I mean? Everything. Professionalism. Professionalism, being able to take critique. Because I, I, I didn't I didn't want to take I couldn't take criticism from nobody. I got a funny story. When I was recording my album with Just Blaze, there was a guy who was homeless and Just Blaze would let him sleep in the studio. Cause there was a big lounge with a big couch. So one day, I didn't know the guy was homeless. I was just like, why is the guy sleeping here at night sleeping on the couch? I didn't know who he was. I'm like, he's he looks too young to be a fucking bum. He's not dirty, he's kind of clean, but he always comes here to go to sleep at night. So just told me, like, nah, he's just going through some things. So one day I'm in the A room. This is Baseline Studio where Jay-Z recorded all his albums, where, like, this set and Just Blade, where they made all Baseline, the infamous Google, Young Gurus, Homo Young Guru. So one day I'm in there recording, and the guy from the couch walks in, and he's like, yo, if I was you, I'd have said like this. You just change that around. I'm like, who, who the fuck is uh, And I, I, I was bad at taking criticism. So I told the nigga, yo, you know what the fuck? I'm Saigon, nigga. Get the fuck out of here talking to me about what I should say. And it was Jay Electronica. Hold on. <laughs> it was Jay Electronica, man. Like, I didn't, I, I, I had no fucking clue. So one day when they put out that record, that exhibit C, it was exhibit C. I'm like, yo, Joss, who the fuck is this dude? He's like, that's Jay. I'm like, who the fuck is Jay? He's like, Jay from the studio. I'm like, who the fuck is Jay from the studio? He's like, nigga, you know Jay, but I never even bothered to get a nigga the time of day. I was arrogant and cocky and dumb and drunk most of the time and high, high or weed. He's like, nigga, Jay, they was sleeping on. I'm like, the nigga from the couch is the. And that was Jay Electronica. And the nigga, if I had known who he was or I knew he had that level of talent, I would have loved for him to come and critique my shit and help me out or say, nah, don't say that. Say this, say this. And that's, so that's a funny story because for man long, I, I'm sitting there telling this nigga, yo, beat it. I didn't even know how. And when he's critiquing my shit, I'm like, nigga, who are you to critique me? Like, that was my attitude. You know what I'm saying? You never know who you're talking to. That's why I, I treat that, that. That was a life lesson right there. It's crazy, man. That definitely is crazy. Um, can you tell me about your first opportunity? How, can you tell me about how your first opportunity came about to work with Jay-Z? Um, yeah, it, it was only one opportunity. It wasn't more than one. And it, it was because Jay, the thing is, like, with, with Baseline, it was all like a family thing, right? Because you had Just Blaze and one. Kanye was Kanye at this point. He was already gone doing his artist shit. But before that, it was like, they had a small room with Just Blaze and Kanye would make beats and shit. And they had the big A room where with Cam and them guys, with you know, Dipset, whoever, Beanie, whoever was on Rockefeller. Because Rockefeller owned Jay Z and him owned the studio, OG Wong. And so it was like a family unit. You would hardly see Jay when Jay was there, it was different kind of energy. Like Jay Z today. Jay Z today. <laughs> Shit is different when Jay comes, you know what I'm saying? But when, yeah, Jay Z, one day, one day while making my album with Just Blaze, you know, he's like, yo, I remember that beat you picked? I'm like, yeah, that shit, I'm about to kill it. Like, yo, Jay, like, Jay heard it and he likes it. <laughs> so I'm like, fuck it. Give it to, first, my first attitude was like, nigga, get that shit to Jay-Z, nigga. Go make your money. Go, you know what I mean? That shit might be a hit song. might be a single. So that shit happened once and twice and three. Then it, once it happened like three times, four. I'm like, yo, son, you can't keep giving Jay-Z my, all my beats. I'm making an album here. Like, you giving this nigga the heat. I'm picking these shits because they the fire. And so, come on, baby, was one of the beats where I was where I was like, yo, I, I was just Blaze already knew I 
added up to here with the Jay-Z taking my beat shit. And so come on, he gave me come on baby. I'm like, all right, cool. This is gonna be my this is it. I love this beat. And the nigga, and one day I come in and he's like, yo, I need to holler at you. I'm like, all right. When you say that, it's only one of two things. Either you made something crazy or Jay took one of my beats again. So, so I was like, you like, I need to holler at you. I'm like, oh. Shit. He said, like, yeah, and Jay took the come on back. I'm like, I now, now I'm mad. I'm like, I don't fucking hear it. Why was he even hearing these beats? Are you playing this thing to the beats that you gave me? You know what I'm saying? Like, how was he hearing these beats? He's like, nah, I was playing him some of the new nick, what we working on. He asked what we working on. He went to hear it, and I played him that shit. He was like, yo, you know, it's the big homie. So I was like, you know what? Fucking it's Jay. You know what I mean? He was like, don't worry about it. I can make a million of them shit. I can make something better than that. So I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. I, I didn't even write to it yet. And I was like, fuck it. Being I ain't write to it, I was like, fuck it. It is what it is. Another one. I'm like, please, can you stop it? He's like, no, it ain't going to happen again. And sure enough, he made um that, oh, kingdom come, kingdom come. You ready? He made that beat for me. That was my beat. The, with the Rick James sample, I will be kingdom come. I mean, they saying like, hold me back. That was my beat, and Jay took it. So, but this time, I made a, I made a, a, a fucking tantrum. I threw a tantrum behind it. So what Jay did honorably was like, you know what? He said, yo, because he had recorded on, come on, baby, he put with that one verse on it. He said, I'm gonna take this beat, but you can keep that verse that I, you can use that verse for your album that I put on the other beat. <laughs> And I was like, nigga, you can take all the beats out of that. Like, you, can take, <laughs> you can take every beat in the world. But for me and Jay always had a good relationship. Even before that, like Jay's a Brooklyn nigga. He's a good, he's a good guy. He's a Jay Z's a good guy. And for him to be that level he's at, he's the most humble, modest. If you don't know Jay Z, you would think like he walks in the room floating, like he's larger than life. But he walks in there and he's like you. You'd be like, dang, you're Jay Z, nigga. And he'd be like, nigga, you're you. What the fuck? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So he's the most down to earth celebrity of that magnitude and now billionaire. I haven't been around him since he's been a billionaire, but I'm sure he, he ain't changed, man. He's, he's, a, he's a great man.